I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Eric Chamberlain. Um, he is here uh, to present for us on the Immersive Learning Research Network uh, webinar series for Tech for Good. Eric's been doing some amazing uh, work uh, with a plethora of different tools and uh, interesting projects to showcase. Um, so it really fits the theme well, and uh, it's a real pleasure to, to have you on today, Eric. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, get this show started here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as you can see, the title is Making the Leap from Web 2. I'm going to say 2 instead of having to say 2.0 because in my preparation for this, it turns out that it takes a long time to keep saying web 2.0. So I'm just going to st straighten it up. So yep. making the leap from web two to the immersive web three. Uh, and that graphic, you'll, you'll notice uh, the graphic is built in such a way and it will make sense as we go through the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Here's my goals or the agenda for today. First, uh, we're going to start with some definitions because I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, certainly when you hear Web 3.0, there are plenty of versions and narratives and certain companies have completely changed their name to try and capture the entire Web 3.0. Uh, so we're going to start off with some definitions and then talk about how Web 3.0 can drive uh, immersive learning. Uh, I've been doing tech education for quite a while, and whenever you are trying to um, determine the efficacy or determine the setup for um, integrating technology into education. There are different models that you can use. And one that I find is the most um, flexible and easiest to use is called the SAMR model. So we're going to dig into that and then apply the SAMR model to immersive learning and um, the spatial web. And then towards the end, talk a little bit about the advantages of WebXR. And I'm pretty sure that there's going to be some time to jump out of the presentation mode and then go into some real world examples that are on the internet. I also have developed a, uh, a resource page that I'm going to share out uh, to the folks that come to the webinar, uh, probably via email. And so you'll have these links. You don't have to scramble to take notes or you know capture, <laughs> take, a, take a screenshot of the page. You'll have all of those links that you'll be able to go to later on uh, on your own time. So before we get started, um, let me come back to the chat. Uh, who Who is here and where are you from and what do you do? I'm interested to know, I'm interested to know what type of educators or instructional designers or what, what brought you to today's uh, session. So Jonathan, I don't, I don't see the chat anymore. So if you, if you see some of those answers, if you could just let me know what some of the respondents say. Yeah, sure thing, Eric. Um, yeah, uh, Terry uh, Jenkinson and Helen um, are here. Um, please feel free to type in the chat and I'll let you know. Thanks, Eric. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I can bring it up again. There we go. Oh. Uh, while you're typing that in, I'll let you know that I am actually coming to you from the southwest of France. Um, I have been living here for the last three years, and I work uh, online. I'll tell you a little bit more about that throughout the presentation, but I work online for an international um, online K-12 school. Awesome. <clears throat> nice. Okay. So... A little bit more about me and my journey because it will help frame um, my perspective, but also my uh, understanding of this long journey that we've had with uh, the internet over the last 25 years. I started teaching in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine in 1999, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time because two years later, uh, then Governor Angus King in the state of Maine proposed and passed uh, the largest technology initiative in the world at the time, which included giving every seventh and eighth grade student in the state a device. Um, initially, they put the 
bid for the project out to numerous companies. And it turned out that Apple won that bid. So um, 96,000 devices were distributed across the state of Maine in 2002. My school and my principal decided to apply to be what were going to be demonstration schools the springtime before, because this has never been done before. So uh, Apple and the state and, and that different companies needed to figure out lots of stuff. So I was there at the ground level. We learned right alongside Apple professional development folks and things like where to place hot, uh, hot spots to ensure that Wi-Fi were covered, uh, where to put the devices at night, because at that time, storage carts weren't a thing because one-to-one -one was not a big enough thing in education. Uh, do the kids take them home, policies, and then, of course, what to do with them in the classroom. Uh, I absolutely loved it. It was a phenomenal four or five years where I was in the classroom in that one-to-one um, -one environment. That springboarded me to start uh, or manage several other one-to-one -one initiatives, um, both at private high schools, at uh, college level. I worked at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts for a couple of years and helped um, develop their new iPad initiative. And then lastly, uh, as the director of digital learning for the Salem, Massachusetts school district as the director of digital learning. So that took me up to the pandemic and my wife and I decided to go and teach internationally in Kuwait in 2019. And six months later, the pandemic came and uh, my life certainly has changed drastically since then. In fact, I have been remote ever since. Um, for the last year and a half in Kuwait, we taught 100% remote because the pandemic was raging. And then I moved back here to France and I've been working online ever since. So that has framed my reality uh, quite a bit. I currently work for uh, a school called Avenues, the World School, and I help manage and direct the technology um, as well as policy and the user experience. Two years ago, my supervisor approached me with a new pilot project where he wanted me to go and um, purchase uh, a VR headset, a 360 degree camera, and any other software that I needed, uh, myself and a coworker, to determine if virtual reality was, you know, in a place where it would be a good addition to our international online school. F fantastic. I, I didn't know anything about virtual reality. And so jumped in uh, wholeheartedly um, and absolutely love that uh, medium. I do believe that virtual reality and mixed reality is the future. However, it is not quite ready for prime time yet. Not only do I not think that it's ready for prime time in regular K-12 education, but it certainly is not ready for prime time for our school. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, our school has students in 42 different uh, countries around the world. And so as such, of course, the accessibility for the hardware is limited. You can't live in Indonesia and buy a Meta headset. And then on that graphic there on the right-hand side over Asia, that's a, a competitor to Meta called Pico. Uh, which is owned by a Chinese company. And you can't buy a Pico in the United States because it's Chinese company. So there are headsets available around the world. However, you can't buy a MetaQuest batch of headsets for your students and be immersed and, and lock in on that operating system because we can't purchase those headsets around the world. So I was a little bit deflated initially when I you know, kind of came to that realization However, what that led me to search for was, is there a solution, is there a middle ground where uh, we can still add some virtual mixed augmented reality to our curriculum, but it be accessible across all devices? And it turns out that I learned about and became quite uh, a fan of the WebXR um, protocol for lack of a better word, I'm not entirely sure you would call it a protocol, but that's what I call it. And we're going to talk much more about that if you are not familiar with what WebXR is. But the short story is that it would allow us to begin to leverage 
uh, virtual reality and some of the benefits there, but it would be available on the students' laptops, their tablets, and for those families that do have access, a VR headset. So that's how I came to be here today, <laughs> ultimately, uh, because two years ago, uh, I had no idea any of this existed, and I was pretty focused on traditional um, technology integration. Okay, so let's move on to some definitions. Uh, this will help frame the rest of the conversation because the title, of course, is Making the Leap from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. Uh, most of the people that have been in education for a while probably remember Web 1.0. Web As I was making this presentation, I was having fond memories of remembering when I first got a, an internet-connected computer in 1992, I think that was, uh, living in Colorado, and my family lived in Maine. And so we had great fun getting on AON and being able to chat with my mom and my dad in real time. And <clears throat> from an educational standpoint, uh, Web 1.0 was very much what we launched the MLTI laptop initiative uh, in the state of Maine. So we, yes, we had laptops, but these were Mac iBooks. So pre OS 10, incredibly slow, had the spinning beach ball of death quite frequently. But at the same time, the idea that every student had a device available to them all the time was uh, just an unbelievable experience. I'll tell a quick story. I taught eighth grade economics, uh, eighth grade social studies, and we had a unit on economics. And as soon as I, uh, as soon as the availability of the laptops came open, I said, well, I'm not going to teach how I used to teach, you know, presentations on things like buying a house versus renting a house or interest rates and stuff like that. So I developed a unit where the students would, uh, click on a random number on the PowerPoint slide, and they would be given a reality. And that reality was, are they married? Are they single? Do they have children? They would then give me three choices of a job that they would want to have. I went to the actual Bureau of Labor Statistics and found the actual monthly salary for that job. They got that, that reality and that paycheck, and they opened up a checking account, and I actually built paper checkbooks. Then to teach them about housing, for example, I did do a brief presentation. They read some things on the internet and then they actually had to go and buy a house or rent an apartment because they had their own laptop. Zillow, of course, was not around back then, but the, the web was uh, mature enough that they could actually go and search for an apartment. And it was the excitement and the tenacity and the engagement with the students was just off the chart, even though it was slow and frustrating and web 1.0, web 1.0. So transition into Web 2.0, uh, which we are still very much enjoying uh, because, as you can see here, there are several companies that were came to life, uh, born, if you will, during Web 2.0, during the social and portable web section. So Web 2.0 has opened up a lot of opportunity. Um, devices, uh, I've got devices here all over my desk. We have apps that can talk to other apps, social video, video on the fly, et cetera, et cetera. We all know what Web 2.0 has done for us. <clears throat> in my opinion, Web 2.0 is, is a little long in the tooth. It's a little old. It's a little tired. And what I mean by that is some of these companies have been around. Uh, Quizlet was actually started in 2006, uh, eight, uh, what's that, 18 years ago. Um, YouTube 2006, Nearpod 2011, Padlet 2012. So some of these companies have been around for 10, 11, 12 years. And if you look at what they looked like when they first started and what they look like now, there's really not a lot of difference. Sure, they've added a couple of nice features here and there, but they essentially do the same thing that they did when they were first born, first started. Okay. Now, I completely understand because I already mentioned I was in Kuwait for it the development and the advancement of technology integ integration definitely got uh, flipped on its head during the pandemic. So uh, had we not had the pandemic, I think we would have a completely different experience in terms of the internet and tools that are available. But uh, plenty of people, plenty of teachers got knocked, uh, knocked on their ass 
and um, have some of them are still recovering from that. And so that's why they're still lingering in or holding on to Web 2.0 uh, legacy tools. We are definitely also in Web 3.0. And as I said at the outset, Web 3.0 can mean a lot of different things, depending on who you talk to. There is the blockchain or the decentralized web, meaning that you can do, uh, you can exchange money, you can exchange, uh, um, what's that called? Bitcoin. And that is all organized through the blockchain. I am not an expert on that. So I'm not going to go any further than that. Other people, when you hear Web 3.0, they picture Mark Zuckerberg and Metaverse changing the name of Facebook to Meta to try and oversee or take control of Web 3.0. I am, when I say Web 3.0, I am talking about the spatial immersive web. And it has to do with the underlying technology that drives a lot of tools and a lot of options that we're going to go into in this presentation. So a major difference, the major difference between Web 2 and Web 3 is the fact that Web 2, interestingly, not it just lines up this way, uh, is very two-dimensional. So the, the computer that I'm on has a screen and I can move pictures left and right and up and down. Web 3 opens up the Z axis. So on the screen here, now I can go up and down, left and right. But I, but I also can go in and out. So here's a couple of quick little screenshot videos that I took to show you what that means. I made this World War I oral histories example, and the user actually walks through and into the page and goes up to the first soldier here. And then there's an audio piece, which you're not going to be able to hear. It's not important. That's not part of this example. Just to show you the depth and the difference between a flat two-dimensional web and, and an immersive spatial 3D web. Here's another example uh, at the bottom. This is a presentation about the Costa Rica um, Monta, I think it's called Monta Verde uh, Forest Reserve. So when I click on that, again, this is just a presentation that is built within a wrapper that allows you to import things like a three-dimensional map, which is in the middle. 3D, uh, 3D models of trees, and then wrapped around a 360 degree photo. But at the end of the day, it's a presentation. So the user can still just go click, read and learn about it, but they're moving around in and out of the experience. So the crux of what I'm gonna be talking about today is moving students and teachers from the two dimensional static web to the immersive spatial web and how to do that while still holding on to and leveraging all the tools that they've been using in web 2.0. I'm going to hold off on these examples, just the way that Zoom is organized. I'm going to go through my presentation and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you some of these examples live. Uh, and we'll switch over to my Chrome, <clears throat> switch over to the web. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about making the leap. <clears throat> I'm gonna try and make an analogy that came to me last month while I was skiing. And I don't know if the people that are watching here have ever skied, but generally people understand what skiing is, right? Here's, here's a video of a typical ski slope, probably somewhere in Colorado based on the amount of people and the amount of snow. But I have skied my whole life and not trying to brag or, you know, whatever. I My parents put me on skis when I was two years old, uh, one and a half. And I was lucky enough to go to a ski academy for high school to become a ski racer. And then I went back and worked at that ski academy for seven years. So I've skied when I was there, we would ski over 100 days a year. So what I mean by I've skied a lot. OK. And while I was there. I got bored of and kind of tired of that same old, you know, everybody rides the same lift, everybody skis down the same trail. It got kind of rote and it got kind of boring. And I searched for something more. And thankfully, friends of mine 
introduced me to what is called backcountry skiing. Backcountry skiing here in France means something completely different because all of the mountains are communally owned. There is no, there is no private property. There is no sign that says you can't go here. You can effectively go wherever you want. And so because I have my skiing skills and this new equipment, this is an example of some skiing that I was able to do <clears throat> last month. And the video cuts out for a second and it comes back in. But you can see completely alone, uh, perfect conditions, can go wherever I want. And it is a completely immersive uh, experience that I now have. Now, on that day, I actually hiked up the mountain with this, the special equipment and skied back down only one run, five hours. But it was amazing. I, was, I could hear the birds. I could hear my foots uh, as I went up the mountain, every squeak in the snow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what does it take to go from regular skiing or Web 2.0 to immersive skiing, Web 3.0? It takes a simple change of equipment, small. Notice at the top, if you've never skied before, that's what is called a ski boot and a ski binding. Those click in and you are locked in and you attach to those when you go traditional inbound skiing. To go backcountry skiing, all you have to do is change your binding so that you can turn the back and your heel can come up, put a little thing called skins on the bottom of your skis, and that's all you can do. Everything else is the same. Uh, the jacket, the poles, the helmet, the actual skis can be the same. The boots can be the same. When you get up to the top, me skiing down, it's the same muscles, it's the same style, but that one small little change completely opened up and uh, allowed me to be immersed in skiing, okay? So that's my, hopefully that analogy makes sense. I've got other examples, including a whole video that I did of that day that's available on YouTube if you wanna find out more, or if you like to ski, the, the pictures that day were just unbelievable. It's important for me when thinking about technology integration, because I've been doing this for a long time, it's important to not get caught up on the shiny new thing. And in my opinion, many people are caught up with VR, MR, particularly with all the buzz around Apple's headset uh, a couple of months ago, that they're, they're thinking, oh my gosh, that is, that is going to be the way, that is amazing, and it does this and it does that. And they're forgetting that the majority of teachers utilize a series of tools and a series of, of hardware, and they are very comfortable with those, and they don't have a lot of time, nor do they have the ability to take large risks because of the way that the assessment is set up and the way schooling is set up. They need to make small incremental changes, and they have to know that they can still access the work that they've been working on over the last years. That's been my experience. That's the, been my frame of mind as I've been looking at um, you know, this web two to web three transition. Now, some people won't get it. Some people are thinking that technology education needs to be the next greatest thing. Others, particularly because in when when we were going through the main laptop initiative, the mantra was the teaching and the education was first, and then we would add the laptops. Be just because we had the laptops all the time, we were not we did not have the screens open. Uh, you know, for the full hour of the class. That's been my training and it's been a, a very core understanding and belief that I've had. So as you apply that here to the transition from web two to web three, it's important to pay attention and know that you're still going to be able to leverage your ed puzzles, your padlets. It's important to make sure that your new tool can work on the Chromebooks, which the data shows is about 65% of the schools in the United States, the students have a Chromebook. If it doesn't work on the Chromebook, you don't have a new idea. You don't have a new movement. You have a fringe thing that might work in those schools that have MacBooks, but you're not gonna be able to come up with a style or a format that is going to be uh, accessible to all. Okay, a couple other de definitions before we get into the next section. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. I've said a couple of things throughout this presentation. I just want to clear them up because it's important to understand this next part. 
So on the left, virtual reality, I'm pretty sure whether you've had your head in a headset or not, you can picture what that means. Uh, the definition of virtual reality is being taken out of your, your reality and put into a virtual one through a head-mounted display, an HMD. In the middle is augmented reality, where you take a device and that device overlays a digital product in your physical space. And then the one on the right is one that is starting to become a little bit more popular. It's extremely popular and effective in the industrial uh, and then the business realm. That's mixed reality, where you have a device on your head, but it has pass through, meaning you can see your physical environment and it's overlaying the virtual uh, material there. So as I said at the beginning of this presentation, because my school is around the world and we don't have access to the, uh, the one style of headset, I needed to focus on WebXR. WebXR allows you to take the benefits of the spatial and the virtual and the augmented reality, but it's available in the browser. So therefore it becomes available from any device, phone, tablet, laptop, and by the way, future proof, because you can also access WebXR content in a, in a VR headset. So a frame, in, frame VR environment that I'm gonna show you later in this presentation, I can access it here on my laptop. I can also get one of my two VR headsets out, put it on, and I can also access it. So it's future proof for that day that comes down the road where you probably are going to have VR headsets in education. A couple other definitions that drive my work and my frame of mind when I'm thinking about this. The web is uh, a series of internet interconnected. Um, the web is a series of interconnected pages with hyperlinks going from one to the other, which in web 1.0 didn't, that was fine. As web 2.0 came along, we all know if you've been doing any work with any students that are in the classroom and they have a device in front of them that they don't pay attention to where they came from or where they're going. And so this picture at the bottom with the, the tabs, you know, we're all, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. I'm not trying to cash a doubt there, but for a student, a sixth grade student who is trying to do a learning experience and he's got step one and step two and step three, and he's trying to go back and find where he was for step one, that's an issue. It's always been an issue. It's one of my biggest pet peeves with things like Google Classroom and the whole Google Suite is they really don't allow you to embed content inside of them. And embedding is not a new technology. It's been around for quite a long time. What, the as the name would imply, in, if you leverage the embed code, and the tool allows you to do that, then you can put a web experience inside and nest it inside of another one. I know you all know what this looks like when you go to a business page and down at the bottom, they have a Google map that you can move around and, and manipulate. That Google map is embedded in that business's web page. Okay. So for me, I've always been searching for and leveraged tools that allow you to embed. So um, when I was searching for a learning management system back in Salem, uh, I found myself uh, focusing on Schoology, which has been since been bought out by Power, Power School, I think it's called. But Schoology was a great learning management system because you could embed this, the, the, the learning experience inside of the LMS. The kids never had to leave. Genially is another great example of a, of a Web 2.0 app that allows you to embed other tools and the, then you've just got one place, simple. <clears throat> Going back to frameworks and understanding how things are organized, Web.0, Web 1.0, um, Bernie Dodge out of San Diego State University developed and popularized um, something called a web quest, which was allow, allowed a teacher to create a structured learning experience on the web 1.0. Then as the tools changed and the possibilities changed, that morphed into something called HyperDocs, a very, very, very popular um, methodology or framework, if you will, for creating a learning experience where 
Um, generally speaking, the student goes to the learning experience and all of the material that they need is packaged in that typically Google slide or Google doc. However, when the student clicks on the Padlet or the YouTube, actually YouTube now embeds in Google, but most of the other tools, it opens in another tab, always been a pet peeve of mine. So when I began to understand and explore this uh, new environment that we're in with WebXR, I have actually developed and, and kind of coined the, the next model, if you will, called XR Docs. And so I'll show you some examples when we get when I jump out to the web where a student can be in a learning experience and you want to leverage your Padlet, they click on that and the Padlet opens in the lower left, which is similar to that picture that's on the window right now. And they can still move around and have access to the Padlet. It's not a game changer. It's not the end of the world, but it is a small increment forward on top of the other things that we're going to talk about, like spatial audio and et cetera, that in my opinion, levels things up. Some other benefits with <clears throat> WebXR that I have found that I think are differentiators, if you will, from Web uh, 2.0, and that is the sense of, uh, I mean, the use of spatial audio. If I go outside of my house and there's a bird in the front yard and it's chirping and I walk around the house, then I'm not going to hear that bird quite as well. It'll, it'll be faint. I can probably still hear it. If I walk to our village and someone is standing to my right and talking, I'm going to sense that they are to my right. Okay. So that's what I mean by spatial audio. Web 2.0 audio is static and it's, and it's two dimensional. It's either loud or it's soft, but there is no sense of presence. There is no sense of space. So again, when we get out to the web, I'm going to show you some examples of how you can leverage spatial audio to give that added sense of presence. So if you've got a car or you've got a train in your learning experience and you get closer to the train, then the train gets louder. And th that just matches in your head. It's like, this makes sense. This is what happens in the real world. And it's happening now in this immersive learning experience. <clears throat> Another thing that has come to mind for me real quickly, uh, of course, being an online school, we have to leverage some type of tool to meet synchronously. And of course, we use Zoom primarily to do that. If you are interested, if you also use Zoom to meet with people, uh, I've done a full breakdown of all the tools and all the possibilities with Zoom and uh, a tool called Frame VR, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And they do the exact, they, they can do the exact same things, as well as the benefits that we can talk about later with Frame VR, just as an aside. So, what this means is that now you have the ability, your students have the ability to develop an idea, sketch it out either on paper or on a, on, on a whiteboard somewhere. Then they have the ability to generate 3D models and a perspective about what that would look like in the broader sense. And very, very shortly, they will then be able to turn that into an experience for you to immerse yourself in. That is coming. It's not quite there yet. The first two pieces are certainly there. And with the rapid uh, developments of augmented, I mean, uh, of artificial intelligence and the ability to create 3D models and th full 360 degree immersive spaces, we are very, very shortly away from a student to be able to say, okay, I want to create, uh, I want to create the Oregon Trail again, but I want to have the Oregon Trail viewable from different perspectives. So what did the Oregon Trail look like to the natives? What did the Oregon Trail look like to the, to the um, pioneers? What did the Oregon Trail look like to the animals? Um, all of those types of things are, are, some of them are available now. Others we are very, very close to, and you should be starting to think about and embrace the idea that those are coming. Here's another aspect or power of WebXR. Um, DICE is an acronym or yeah, acronym that uh, Stanford University has coined and VR, they, they believe that VR, WebXR in this example is perfectly placed for anything that is dangerous, impossible, counterproductive or expensive. 
So in this example, this is a Google Street View video where some people climbed down into the mouth of a volcano in the South Pacific and create and brought the Google Street View, you know, 360 degree cameras. And so you can walk down and hike into and move around inside of a volcano, which of course nobody would ever do uh, in real life. <clears throat> so that's another power or another benefit that you can get out of WebXR. Okay, at the outset, I talked about thinking about technology integration from looking at it through the eyes of a model. And one of the reasons why I'm a fan of the SAMR model is uh, Dr. Pudentera, who developed this, it was actually in Maine, uh, moved to Maine physically, can't remember where he was from originally, and lived in Maine and studied the one-to-one -one aspects of the Maine Learning Technology Initiative. And not long after, some of his research uh, developed into this model. So if you've seen it before, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, they, the four levels are, as it says, substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. Uh, there's a lot of models out there. There's a lot of people that have beefs with this model. Again, for the purpose of this presentation, don't have a lot of time to get into that. But uh, this is probably a better way to picture what SAMR represents. So the person standing on the ground says, I wonder what's in the ocean. And without any technology, that's all you can do is wonder. So with the technology that he has with the, with the canoe, that's at the substitution level. So he still wonders what's in the ocean because he's not in the ocean. He's got a canoe and a paddle. He can float around all he wants. He doesn't have any direct access to the water. Augmentation, tech acts as a direct tool substitute with functional improvement. So the person with the snorkel is in the water, can see a little bit, but it's still not completely able to solve the question of what's in the ocean. Then we get up to the second, uh, second tier, if you will, where up at the bottom, you can see this is where it starts to move into transformation. So tech allows for significant task redesign. If you've got a scuba on your back and you've got the ability to navigate that, you can go and spend hours uh, underneath the ocean and, and solve that question, what's in the ocean? And then last, of course, redefinition, tech allows for the creation of new tasks previously inconceivable. So there's our framework. That's what SAMR means. Let's take a peek at what that means in terms of WebXR. <clears throat> Everybody in education makes presentations, okay? Um, that they've been doing it for years. Of course, the sage on the stage, it's not great pedagogy, but we all do it from time to time because that you've got information, you need to share it, or students make presentations. Here is an example where I needed to make a presentation about the weather in France to a group of kindergarten and, and first grade students. And I broke that presentation up and I put it into WebXR so that they could move from slide one to slide two. That's substitution, okay? I didn't really redefine anything. I just did what I used to do outside of WebXR and I put it into WebXR. This next example is not mine, but it is, uh, uh, again, I'm gonna show you this and give it to you as a resource. It's called Tape Letters. Apparently in the 1960s and 1970s, when Pakistani and Afghanistan immigrants would travel to Great Britain and back, there was the only way that they could communicate was, well, maybe not the only way, but the preferred way was to record on old school cassette tapes, the stories of the day, the, the news of grandpa, the, the village news. And so they would record these, you know, sometimes 50 and 60 minute long stories. And then the next person that traveled to Great Britain would bring these tapes. So this museum gallery is all around what that looked like. And then you can actually go in there and you can play some of the audio. Okay. So we're, we're, we're we've kind of upped, this is the augmentation level. We've added some video. There's also some, some videos in there, but you know, we haven't redefined anything. Excellent, excellent project. Uh, you should, definitely should check that out. Okay, modification level. This is where you can begin to see the power of the immersive web. And this is a <clears throat> gallery that I made in honor of Women's History Month. Um, and it includes 3D models that I generated with AI. It includes 3D models that I made with Tinkercad. 
And now you're starting to see a, a functional change between what we used to do and what's now possible, okay? So that would be at the modification level. There's other options, and I'm gonna talk about those in a second, but that just gives you a sense of something that I've built at the modification level. Now, the redefinition, no, the, the whole crux of WebXR, in my opinion, and the spatial immersive web is the redefinition. So I'm, I'm only gonna spin two tails because I could talk about this for hours. <clears throat> so imagine that today with WebXR, you could have students in France on a Pico VR headset, along with students that are in Argentina on a Samsung tablet, okay? Teacher launches a Frame VR WebXR experience and launches a Google Street View to take them to different cathedrals or places of worship in the world to be able to compare and contrast and walk around and get a sense of where those are synchronously, that was not possible before. That is a definition, that is an example of redefinition. Or the bottom example with the bridges, um, building bridges, uh, particularly out of newspaper, cardboard, popsicle sticks, toothpicks has been around for a long time. That is a that's a time-tested uh, project for you know, web 1.0, even before the internet. So today we could create an ex example where students are studying engineering, viewing videos, images, PDFs, audio in a frame VR environment. Then they create the bridge at home with their physical uh, material like they have forever and either video conference in with a live video to show everybody their model or better yet, use their phone or their tablet and use an app like Genie, uh, Luma AI Genie or Polycam and take a 3D model, upload that 3D model into the frame VR space and the other students would be able to walk around and see the different techniques that you used. If you wanna throw one more level on top of that, you could invite a professional or an expert in structural engineering to come to the space synchronously with the students to be able to give them feedback on what they did well and maybe some uh, ways to upgrade upgrade their models. So real quickly, substitution level, what we've been doing all along. Augmentation level, adding some audio, maybe a streaming screen and a whiteboard. Modification, bringing in 3D models, either you go and download the 3D models or 3D models you make yourself. <clears throat> Interactions, voice zones, which we haven't talked about yet. And then redefinition, um, there's now the ability to bring in an AI avatar, which, was, which is a neat idea, but you can also then give that AI avatar, upload the important information that it needs to know so that the students, so in this particular scenario, the students would be talking to an AI avatar that has all of your framework and all of your you know, bullet points and, and information to make sure that it keeps the kids on target and uh, focused on what they're doing. Okay. Looking uh, 10, 12 minutes left. Okay, cool. So where do you go to make such a, an, ex, an immersive experience? I spent many months scouring, downloading, testing, trying, and there are lots of options. Uh, many come out every week, every month, it feels like. However, as I said before, some of those are uh, focused on industry. Some are... Um, have a user agreement that only allows users to be 18 over. So those are off the limit for, I mean, off the list in terms of education. So my research, I focused on three companies, Mozilla Hubs, Engage, and Frame VR. Since that time, Mozilla Hubs has unfortunately uh, announced that they're going to shut down, I believe next month, if not this month. So they're off the list. And so it became down to Engage and Frame VR. Engage does great things. They are, they are a, uh, probably if I was in an environment where every student had a VR headset, I believe that their strength lies there. In the WebXR example that I have, they miss the mark uh, on a couple of things. Most importantly, they don't do things like embedding Web 2.0 tools and Google Street View, uh, some other tools such as these. Again, made a long, very detailed YouTube video about that that you can find on my channel. 
if you want to dig in and learn more. But in my opinion, Frame VR is the best in class for the reasons, at least the reasons that are on the screen, if not probably seven more. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is, as I promised as I was going through the presentation, we're actually going to jump out of the presentation and go check out some live frames to show you what it is I was talking about. So stop that. And jump over here. Okay, so uh, one other reason why I believe Frame uh, is more accessible and, and a better option than Engage. Engage requires the downloading of software and a, user came, a, a username and a password to, to log in. So that's a friction point. Now, there's reasons to do that, and I get that. But for me, I'm always looking for what's the fastest, easiest access for the users. So here is that tape letters example. This gallery here is one of the 40 or 42 different pre-made environments that you can choose within frame. You do not need to use these. I've noticed uh, in my examples, I know that I use this uh, space a lot, but there are many, many other options. So I can use my keys to move around. I can move forward. I can move back. And then with my mouse, I can grab and I can pivot and look all around. So as I said, this is that example where the immigrants from uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, now they have the ability to leverage Zoom, but in the back in the day, they only had the ability to um, send these cassettes. So this particular company or this particular organization, they're focused on trying to preserve and archive those conversations. Really, really cool. Again, not a terribly complex space, no 3D models, no whiz-bang interactions, but very powerful uh, and, and an excellent example. <clears throat> Here is my Sagrada Familia example, um, a cathedral in Barcelona, the longest standing construction project in the world. I believe it's 135, 137 years. I did not make this 3D model. I bought it offline. It was made by somebody with a drone, which is another great technology that is becoming very powerful. So the users can move around and look at the model and see it from the different angles. And then I have been to Barcelona because it's only a five hour drive from here several times. And taking my 360, why can't I click on that photo? Interesting. Well, you're supposed to click on that photo and there should be a 360 sphere. Let me see if I've got another example here. Ah, so this is a follow-up to the embed feature that I was talking about. So most of you have seen those different companies. So if I click on YouTube, then I can view this video and still be moving around and interacting with the space. I know it's simple, I know it's subtle, but I also know teachers and I know what they need to feel comfortable with taking a risk and moving forward and incorporating something new. And when they know that they can still leverage their Padlets that they've been leveraging for the last five, seven, 10 years, then it's a big, it's a big difference. It's an important thing and <clears throat> Not to mention, it allows you to take a WebXR experience like this and make it more powerful and make it more interactive because you can leverage some third-party tools like this that do different things that are not built in to WebXR. Let's see if these... Ah, there we go. So here's an... Oh, actually, one. Start. Remember I told you about studying cathedrals of, cathedrals of the world? Here is a, an interesting cathedral. This is in Albi, France, and this is actually the largest brick building in the world. It is a cathedral that is monstrous. Um, it's really hard to describe, but with my students here in this experience, we can actually walk synchronously and look at it from different angles around it. And then I can close that out. And then we can say, okay, What's it look like on the inside? And here we have the view from the inside. Where did that go? 
wanted to point this out. Again, I've been to this church. That paint at the top and the ceiling is 500 years old, and it has never been retouched, never been resurfaced. And when you're in there and you're looking up at that, when they told me that, it just it just blows your mind. And there's stuff that we can't make today that lasts five years. But okay, that's an aside. Uh, let's see, a couple others real quick. This is This is not a frame VR experience, but I do want to give a shout out to Google Earth, a favorite product of mine. Uh, fell in love with Google Earth a long time ago. Used to be very uh, labor intensive for your computer. Now they brought it all online. When it first got online, it was still kind of wonky. It is incredibly smooth now. Plus they've added the ability to create content such as this. So as the title says, this is school. And it allows you to go and look at schools around the world to compare and contrast. So here's a school in uh, India. And you, it's it's a Google Street View, so you can move around. It, you're not you're not restricted to just seeing one picture and then clicking and moving on. And then we can fly from India to Nepal. Again, who is ever going to go to Nepal? Okay, some people go to Nepal to hike. Who is ever going to go to Nepal and seek out a school? Very very few people. So this falls under the DICE example, um, expensive or rare. Google Street, I mean, uh, Google Project Builder, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, there is some wonderful content and it's super easy to create your own. Let's see, tape letters, one more. Ah, so I need to stop and I'll do the share to make sure that you get the audio. Okay, so here's an example of Oops. Here is an example of the spatial audio. Uh, I'm from Maine, and so I built this um, example of like a Maine museum, if you will, to learn about the state, as opposed to going to 50states.com and reading about what's the state bird, et cetera. And as I go in, if I turn the sound up, then you can start to hear the sounds of the ocean. So I embedded the sounds of the seagulls in the ocean in this 3D model that somebody created of a lighthouse in Maine, of which there are many. If I move back, it starts to get a little faded. And then if I move far back here, I can't hear it at all. So that's the spatial audio that's available to give you the immersion uh, of what it feels like to be there. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to wrap up, leave some time for questions. As I said, I will share this list of resources. Um, it includes some of the stuff that we've seen already, as well as several other examples that you can check out um, that we didn't have time to do. And this is the link at the bottom for that Google uh, Earth project. Jump back to the presentation for my close. Sorry about that. Two seconds. Okay. So as I've said a couple of times in this presentation, I do believe that VR and MR are the future. They are coming. There is some amazing stuff that you can access. And if you have access to that stuff, fantastic. Enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited for when that's going to come. However, <clears throat> my point of the presentation today is that you do not have to wait. Don't think that you have to wait for the school to invest in headsets and all of that kind of stuff because it could take years. Okay, Get started today and you can make immersive learning experiences that are accessible from any device. Um, I have built out a bunch of material that is available on my website, uh, xrtoolsfored.com as well as the information around the XR docs that I talked about. So if you want for more information, you can definitely go there, reach out, uh, happy to uh, help you get started and looking forward to see what you build and where we go with this new, with this new medium. Fantastic. Wow, thank you so much, Eric. That was really, really great. Um, 
there's so much there. Uh, yeah, um, Terry uh, Jenkinson and Helen Zhu here. Um, yeah, uh, Terry had mentioned at the beginning, she's from Kansas City uh, and mm -hmm. she made interactive 360 degree immersive movies. Um, so- Oh, wow. She, she mentioned that it was it's challenging to find ways to share those movies and have like interactive and immersive parts really work. Um, I thought your presentation was fantastic, though, in the sort of organizational like technology adoption phases with your, you know, the Samer model and, and others like really kind of clues in terms of like how to in, embed and engage uh, different groups. Um, so nicely done. That was really that was really cool. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, back when I first started digging into VR, there's a small startup out of Portland, Maine, believe it or not, called Drift Space. And Drift Space was trying to solve that question around 360 video. And they did, they had a great product. You could take 360 video and make it into a presentation. Mm -hmm. So I could be walking in that cathedral in Al Albi, France, and I could overlay different pieces so that you had more context. It wasn't just the immersion of the 360, as well as then they added the synchronous feature. So you and I could be walking and viewing that together you know, not together, you know, synchronously in the headset at the same time, but uh, no matter where we are in the world. And I, I believe, I don't know if they're still around anymore, but it was a great, it was a, an amazing concept and a glimpse into what I think is coming. Yeah, that's very nice. Well, and, and then the way, you know, frame sets up the, the spheres that you can click on and pop into that. And then you and others yeah, yeah. use that as a spatial way of, you know, situating this this uh, vision can be accessed from this context, and then you popped into the church in in a couple of different ways. And yeah, that's a that's a great uh, I think view for a lot of people to see kind of ways we can cleverly engage and uh, work work with uh, different students and audiences. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Um. Uh, any other questions? I'm seeing uh, some real good comments. Uh, <laughs> loved your skiing example. I too, like I'm here in Montana. And so lots of snow skiing here, but that was absolutely brilliant, you know, to go from uh, traditional downhill to backcountry or telemark kind of style. R really, really neat. Um, there's a question about, are we able to get the link to that Google Doc resources that you yep. show? Um, yep, let me share that right now. And in the chat, and would it be all right for anyone us to with the link on our YouTube? Like we can put that in comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. So Here those of you seeing uh, this on on YouTube, thanks uh, for viewing uh, Eric Chamberlain's uh, amazing, you know, uh, XR Tools for Ed uh, dot com presentation. This is really, really, uh, really great. Thanks, thanks for coming on. And I agree the. The WebXR is just phenomenal. We're we're partnering uh, with Frame VR, uh, Gabe Baker and and the company. Uh, they're just amazing at the how fast they're innovating. And like yeah, you said, the iteration the iteration is crazy. And during the yeah. month of March, I, as you know, on LinkedIn, I did a piece of content a day, and I, I did something like on March fifth, and by March twelfth, it was already. I needed to go back and update it because they had already iterated I, and changed. I know. <laughs> Um, yeah. Terry, um, I think Terry Terry asked about visiting the frame sites. Absolutely, they're all they're all open. Um, in fact, most of them are there. You can clone them if you want, and you could use it as a template. The ones like the tape letters that I don't own, of course, you can't. But any yeah. of the ones that I was the author of, um, yes, you can enter them, tour around. By the way, there's one on there called um, Transitions, and it says presentation about backcountry skiing. I turned that whole story into a a presentation that you have to move through it's hard to describe and i promise you you have never seen a presentation like it so if you mm -hmm. care about skiing and you like that story go check it out there's a lot of cool videos and pictures that i have from my skiing days absolutely yeah the, the good metaphors and good examples are yeah we're thirsty for these and you know it's it's ironic because there's such a flood of tools and but teachers oftentimes really need to know how something might work. Um, they don't have time to <clears throat> explore absolutely without a goal, you know. So yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you so much for sharing. And, and we will definitely be uh, um, amplifying your message. And uh, we're really happy to have you as, as a part of the network. And I will be at the conference in June. So yes. awesome. Presenting uh, at the conference. Yeah. Thank you so much for that as well. So everybody, um, thank you to Eric Chamberlain. And uh, uh, we will um, see you all uh, at the conference here coming up in June, um, either online, that's June 3rd through the 5th, uh, and in Scotland, June 10th through the 13th. Um, so fantastic. Uh, let's keep, keep, keep it going. Keep up the momentum.